Good evening, my name is Rita Hicks and I'm with the League of Women Voters Houston and I would like to welcome you to Public Affairs Public Access. As you know, this is a call-in show, so if at any point during the next hour you hear something you're interested in asking about or chiming in on, please feel free to call. The number is 713-807-1794. In this episode of Public Affairs Public Access, we're going to be talking Texas legislative session. As many of you know, the 84th Texas legislative session ended on June 1st, which was Monday, and and here with me tonight is a panel of uh, distinguished guests to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and what's next for Texas. Um, so I would like to take just a moment to introduce uh, our panelists for you tonight. We have with us Representative Jean Wu. Uh, Representative Wu has been serving as the state representative for District 137 since 2012. Before that, he was a prosecutor in Harris County District Attorney's Office, and he also, in, in his capacity representing District 137, he serves on the House Energy Resources Committee and the House Committee on County Affairs. We also have with us tonight Mr. Charles Kuffner. He is a writer and political commentator. He writes the very popular Off the Cuff blog covering state and local politics, uh, which also appears in syndication on Cron.com and is a regular contributor to other publications such as Houston Press and Texas Monthly. And I actually learned in researching Mr. Kuffner that Wikipedia says Off the Cuff is actually the oldest continuously running political blog in Texas. 14 years strong, so... 13 years. 13 years strong. Okay, well, we're going to have to let those Wikipedia know, people know <laughs> that they are not correct. Last, with last uh, but not least, we have with us Mr. Andrew Tease. He's a professor at Houston Community College teaching American government, Texas government, and courses on state and federal constitutions. He's a... Uh, um, worked for both Texas Legislative Houses as well as the UP, uh, US EPA in DC. And Andrew also serves as the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Houston Apartment Association. Having gotten that out of the way, um, so we have kind of an interesting bunch here tonight. We have with us one legislator, one commentator, analyst, and one educator who also, you know, serves as an advocate um, wearing his other hat. So I think this is actually going to make for a very interesting conversation. Where I would like to start is um, with the two of you, Andrew and Jean, because um, each of you represents a constituency. So you come to the session with a particular idea in mind of what your priorities are, what your constituents care about, and where you want to see the session go. So starting with you, Andrew, can you talk about in this particular legislative session, what, is, what were the things that you were watching for, um, for HAA or otherwise? Well, the Apartment Association is a, is a general business group. We have members who are in a particular business, and uh, like most business groups, their interests are mostly um, small issues. Um, they are less interested in uh, abortion or gay marriage and that sort of thing. They're more interested in small fixes to small problems. Uh, this year, our members had some specific problems in the state property code that they needed fixed. They had some specific problems uh, with respect to what happens when you rent to someone with a criminal history, some things like that. Not big, controversial, sexy issues, but just small issues with small fixes. Right. Representative Wu? Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> there are a thousand uh, issues out there in the legislature. It's impossible for any one member to be sort of an expert on all of them. Um, but uh, our, off so our office focuses mainly on three uh, topic areas, uh, uh, criminal justice and juvenile justice, energy issues, and then, of course, education. Um, and most of our bills that we filed or the and the other bills that we worked on focus on those three main areas. Right. Now, Charles, your um, sort of perspective on session is probably a little bit different. You're not representing a particular constituency. You're looking at it in a much more analytical way. So when you're looking at the 84th session, what is interesting to you? Well, what's interesting is always what uh, the powers that be say they want to accomplish and what they actually do accomplish. I mean, if you listen to Governor Abbott's speech early on, in the session, he laid out his agenda, and he did manage to get a fair amount of it passed, though not all of it, perhaps in the form he would have wanted. He made a, he made a ethics reform, um, an emergency item, and what they got was very watered down to to, to the point of almost nothingness. Um, but you know, he talked about a business pet tax cut, and they got that. He talked about um, some aspects of reining in local control, and they got that in particular with. Uh, the ban on fracking bans, which was aimed at the city of Denton. Um, you know, 
I, I would say that, you know, they, you know, from, from the perspective of someone who is not a Republican, I would say, you know, this session, there were some things that happened that I didn't like, but it could have been a lot worse. I mean, in terms of the, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the big sexy issues that people do fight about, abortion, um, gay marriage, and so forth, you know, there wasn't a whole lot left to do on abortion, you know, I, although they did do something uh, in terms of restrict um, judicial bypass. They filed a bunch of bills, you know, sort of aimed at shaking their fist at the Supreme Court, um, but none of them went <laughs> anywhere. Um, and, you know, there, there was a lot, I mean, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick talked a lot about this kind of tax reform and this kind of, you know, tax cut, and a lot of that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from that perspective, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of noise at the beginning, and then it was, towards the end, it was a lot more quiet. So just for the viewers at home, you know, Charles is talking about volume. Um, there were 11,335 bills filed this session, uh, 8,094 of them in the House, and 3,241 in the Senate. And of that total, 5,685 5, were passed by the House and Senate, still pending vote by the uh, signature by the governor. Um, and that represents 705 more bills introduced compared to the previous session, but 224 bills less were passed. Now, I know going into this session, the dynamic, people were concerned it would change dramatically because the electorate changed dramatically. So what I'm interested to hear from you in particular, Representative Wu, is do you, did it feel like the dynamic was very different this session versus the last session? Um, now, I do have to double check your, the, the numbers you have. I think those actually include a lot of um, sort of uh, ceremonial and obligatory resolutions and things that not, they're not not all bills i think it's actually somewhere around uh closer to five or six thousand mm -hmm. actual uh substantive bills being filed uh, from between the house and senate the house usually files somewhere around uh four four thousand or so and then the senate files about two thousand um but for the most part it did seem like that the uh that the legislature as a whole was running at a much more glacial pace. Some of that is because, like you said earlier, there's really nothing, uh, like Cuff said earlier, there's nothing else to do. Um, I, mean, I mean, I'm a little biased as, as a Democrat, but in terms of the red, really red meat issues on, on the Republican side is, well, voter ID's done, uh, the, you know, the, the nation's most restrictive abortion measures have been passed. Um, I mean, there, what else is there? You know, I mean, even the red meat issues that were offered were just, you know, half-hearted at best. It's like, well, we threw something in there, so we, we placate our people, but, you know, didn't really do much, but because everything's done. Uh, for the, and for the most part, I think the session was a lot more calm. Uh, it was a lot less contentious. And I think the main reason being is that we have money when in 2011 when there was no money and everyone was being slashed then you know people were with you know were, you know pulled out the long knives and were ready to take each other out um 2013 things were significantly better but still you know people were fighting over money people were fighting over which which uh departments get got their funding back first 2015 things were significantly better there's a little money left over and everyone's sort of calm. I mean, I'll, I'll add on to that. One of, the, one of the places where there was a fight, sort of, early on, was not in over who got, who got what money, yeah. but in over how to restrict right. the, the way the money could be spent in the first place. There right. were a number of propositions put forward for further restricting how the legislature can spend money. I mean, right now, of course, everyone knows there's a constitutional requirement for a balanced budget. Right. There's also a constitutional limit on how much the budget can increase from one session to the next. And it's based on um, population growth and economic growth. Well, there was, a, there was a proposal to change that to population growth plus inflation, which has been a lot less nationally and in Texas than, pop, than economic growth. And that would have significantly shrunk the amount of money that the comptroller at the beginning says, okay, here's how much you have to spend. 
that fortunately didn't go anywhere because it would have greatly, you know, in a state that's growing and that has needs like transportation, um, and you know, we're still waiting on a ruling from the Supreme Court on the, you know, the school finance lawsuit, which, if it's upheld, will necessitate, you know, some number of billions to be added into the budget. With all those, you know, you really could have had a situation where the legislature would have tied its hands going forward. That didn't happen, and it, actually, I was a little bit surprised because that was a that was a big priority of you know Lieutenant Governor Patrick and some members of the Senate, um, but it didn't happen. Um, so, and one of the other uh, priorities that you mentioned at the beginning, Charles, was ethics. And if you listen to Governor Abbott talk, give his speech, he actually placed a lot of em emphasis on reform, ethic, re ethic reform, and we really didn't see a lot happen, and I think I was reading somewhere that the last significant ethics reform actually occurred when Governor Richards was in office, so it's been quite a while since any significant reform has taken place. Why do you think that's the case? Um, is it just an inability to obtain cons consensus, or is it just not a priority when other, you know, things that people care about are a priority? What, what, do, we, what do we think? Well, I mean, the, the fight there was over so-called dark money, which is money raised by Nonprofits, quote unquote, that have politic that are really political advocacy fronts, but because they're organized as nonprofit, they are allowed to not have to reveal their donor list. Right. So you know, Joe billionaire out there can write a huge check to you know, you know, people for people united for the American way of life or whatever it is, which calls itself a 501c4, I think it is. Eagle Forum or something. Right, like that. and there's no reporting on it. Right. Um, and this, this, that was a fight more among within the within Republican the Republican Party more than anything else. And you know, th for the most part, the Democrats just sat on the sidelines on that and said, "Like you, you guys figure it out. And let us know when you're done." Yeah, and in, in in fact, the split there was even more pronounced between the Senate and the House. Right. The House was more than willing to put in disclosure requirements for that to say, "Okay." You know, you may be a nonprofit, but if you're doing this kind of political right. advocacy, you've got to disclose your donors. Right. The Senate wanted none of that, and Governor Abbott has since come out and said that you know he believes that's unconstitutional. Um, you know, that that's that's a different question. Um, but that was that was what the fight was about was over that. I mean, I think some of the other items on there, there was probably some level of consensus. You know, in terms of more right. um, person, you know, personal the, finance disclosure for the, members and things like that. The, the problem with the ethics um, reform is that the little good, the little common sense stuff gets mixed in with the big, very partisan stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, there's no way to separate them out because if you have a bill that does the little stuff that everyone's agreeing to, then that bill is also a a carrier for, you know, the big things that people ha are going to have fight about. So when the big things get added on one or the other side is going to find a way to kill the bill because, you know, whatever helps me is going to hurt someone else or whatever hurts someone else is going to help me. And so, you know. And, and I'm curious, and, and, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, teaching government affairs and whatnot, <laughs> how do your students react to this sort of thing? Because this is exactly the sort of thing that yeah. tends to yeah. cause cynicism. Well, <clears throat> first of all, from my HAA hat, I mean, from the, my, uh, my, uh, my client, we disclose everything, and so we, we right. But you're a PAC, not a nonprofit, so it's different. Well, we're right? both. We're, okay. we're a, we have a political action committee. Every penny that we bring in or spend is, you know, dutifully reported to the ethics commission. And then, as an advocacy group, we're a 501c6, which means, you know, every dollar we bring in, every dollar that we spend, it's all reported, you know, meticulously. So, uh, we weren't really we're not going to be affected by that one way or the other. From a teaching perspective, obviously my students come in with a certain amount of cynicism <laughs> about, you know, what's going on and who really controls things and what money really gets spent by whom. And, and from my students' perspective, you know, more disclosure is, is better. I think people tend to see it somewhat simplistically, though. And I've seen over the years, a lot of times when we talk about ethics, we mean well, and it really ends up being more people have to fill out more forms right. with nothing really useful, um, you know, be, being being disclosed. Right. Um, and from an adv advocacy perspective, um, the 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 fees that they that they charge now, you know, in my opinion, are starting to become a little bit 
worrisome, and I know no one's going to shed any tears over lobbyists who have to pay too much money, but you know, it does say in the Constitution we have a right to peaceably assemble and to petition a government petition the government for a redress of grievances. It doesn't say once you deposit 750 bucks, you know, and so, um, you know, I think the more you, in the name of ethics, the more difficult you make that, the more you crowd out smaller, less well-funded groups. My group can afford to, to, to register lobbyists, and, and we don't have a problem with that. There might be a less well-capitalized group that might feel differently than us that might have a problem coming up with that. So just from a good government perspective, I think they should be cautious. I think that's right. And since we're talking to you um, already, Andy, <coughs> property taxes, I feel like that's another one where it kind of split the baby. There was a homestead exemption increase, but other than that, property taxes didn't really go anywhere in particular. Is that is that something that your group was watching? I mean, I know your apartment association, but sure. Um, well, from um, <laughs> from the community college uh, perspective, obviously we're funded by property taxes um, uh, in in large part, and so. Um, you know, we're, we're always curious to make sure that, you know, appraisal bills and things like that are, are, are done correctly. From the apartment uh, perspective, it's a little different. Our members pay a tremendous amount of property taxes, which means renters pay a tremendous amount of property taxes, which is something that a lot of people either don't understand or sort of choose not to understand. But when uh, an apartment property pays property tax, it's the owner writing the check, but whose money do you think he's paying it with? It, right. it's, it, it comes straight from the renters, and so the idea that, oh, well, renters aren't going to benefit, you know, from a uh, change in property tax, uh, you know, policy is, in my opinion, is not, not exactly true. So uh, we're certainly looking at it from that perspective. The homestead exemption really doesn't affect us right. because we don't, we don't get that. Our renters don't get the, the benefit of either a homestead exemption or an income tax deduction for the part of the property tax that they pay. Um, but um, obviously the total amount of property tax, the way appraisals are done, the rights that we have to challenge appraisals that we think are unfair, um, which was also under, under some uh, attack this session, that's certainly something we follow very closely. Right. So Representative Wu, I mean, we, I think, have all followed the trend, especially over the last year, how um, just not only um, rental prices, but also home prices in Houston are just skyrocketing. Sure. So I imagine probably your constituents, this is something that matters to them from a homestead perspective, but also from a taxing perspective, because it affects how much home they can afford or how much apartment they can afford. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, I mean, a lot of the home price uh, and and uh, uh, apartment rent increases has to do with more of our local e economics than right. than any uh, tax policy. Uh, it's really, you know, I don't want to say it's a good thing, but it's a sign that our city's growing, our, our state's growing. Uh, people are moving into the the area that have money. Uh, we have so many jobs being uh, created in our area that we have people who want to rent, and it, it drives up the market. Um, you know, my issue with the with the way um, that the property taxes were done is that I don't think it really does anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the 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 amount uh, given the homestead exemption and everything else is is so de minimis. I don't think any property anybody paying taxes would notice it over the amount that their property's value is increasing, uh, or their their appraisal is being increasing. Uh, you know, I'm biased, but I thought. And I still think that what the House proposed, having a sales tax decrease, would have been a bigger change for people. I think people would have actually seen that in their pocketbooks and would have changed the economics of the way that they made purchases and uh, how much money they had to spend over, um, you know, maybe like $100 out of your entire year's property taxes, but except that your property tax taxes would have gone over, you know, gone up by 1000 Yeah, I mean, th there's always a great irony in this, you know. The argument every time we talk about property taxes is, well, you know, you can cut the rate, but the appraisals keep going up so fast, and appraisals keep going up faster than people's incomes, so they can't afford to keep up with it. And I always say to myself, gosh, if only there was a kind of tax that was proportional <coughs> to the amount of money that you made in a year. <laughs> we could call it a earnings tax. I don't know. Uh, but somehow that never gets brought up in these discussions. That's right. And I think, you know, my... my and again, I, I, I have a little political bias here, but I, I think a lot of um, the way we did the tax cuts this time 
was more about political, was about campaign promises than actual public policy. It's about people wanting to at least try to fulfill some of the promises that they made in campaigning, even though those promises may not have been necessarily realistic. You know, but I, I can't fight that. And you know, some, a lot of times, good policy is bad politics, and bad politics is not, you know, is it, yeah. All right, so we actually have um, a, a person who's called in with a question. Uh, hi, uh, you're live on Public Access, uh, Public Affairs, Public Access. Can you tell us your name and what's your question? James, <clears throat> I wanted to comment about the legislator who wanted to pass a law to drug test all politicians. This sounds, uh, that's the great beginning. Also, what was this about uh, banning uh, detoxifying su substances that uh, were used to uh, evade your analysis, top screen detection. I'll hang up. Thank you. Good show. So I think that our caller is asking us about drug testing, and I believe there was um, a measure that was considered uh, having to do with right. renters being subject to drug, drug testing. Is that correct? I uh, didn't see that one. No, there was no, no it's actually, it was actually a provision added onto the ethics bill that required the drug testing of legislators, oh. <laughs> of state, state, state officials. Um, that was actually introduced uh, by Senator Lucio uh, onto the uh, on, onto Senate Bill 19, the, uh, the ethics bill, um, and that measure was actually stripped out uh, by the House. And one of the reasons it was actually stripped out is because it's unconstitutional. Uh, and that 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 decision was actually decided in 1997 in a Supreme Court decision. Uh, I think South Carolina or one of the deep South states had the same provision says we're going to drug test legislators. Const the Supreme Court says no. Co members of the legislature or Congress or anybody, they have the safe, same Fourth Amendment rights that everyone else has. You can't do a governmental search, um, which is which, what a drug test would be, a governmental search uh, without um, prior suspicion or, or, or without a warrant. Yeah. I mean, there has also been, I don't know that if it came up in this session, but in previous sessions, there was a push drug testing, to welfare. drug testing yep. for people who receive public benefits. Unemployment. Um, so, yeah, and, and that measure was brought up in 2013. It, it was killed on a procedural point, but the same objection would be, I mean, the, those issues have already been ruled on by the Supreme Court. You can't uh, force somebody to take a drug test um, unless you have prior suspicion or you have a warrant. I mean, in terms of drugs, the other thing that was interesting in the legislature were a number of bills, including yes. one that Representative Wu uh, proposed to um, loosen restrictions on marijuana in right. particular. Um, you know, there were a couple of bills that were passed out of session, one of which would have essentially completely legalized it, <laughs> and a couple of others that would have just simply yeah. reduced penalties right. on them. There was the one bill that actually did get passed and is now awaiting the governor's signature um, is one to legalize cannabinoid oils. oils. Right. Which is, you know, for medicinal purposes for certain, you know, for certain patients. Even that was kind of, you know, it, it, it actually it, passed by a wide, pretty it wide did. margins. Um, the advocates for it were not as pleased yeah. with it as they might have been. They right. thought it wasn't, it wouldn't do enough for them. Right. But it was still, you know, all of this was still something that had never been done before in the state of Texas in the legislature. So right. you know, it, it's a step forward. So, and this has been the first uh, first session where we've actually tackled these kind of issues on the floor. Uh, and I mean, as Charles said, I mean, we had a whole range of bills from Representative Simpson's uh, completely remove government from the regulation of marijuana. Period. Um, and it isn't, there's not even, it's not even decriminaliza decriminalization, it's just total legalization. Uh, government has nothing to do with it, period. To um, Representative Moody had a bill that basically said, like, you know, small amounts will make it a civil issue. Uh, I had a bill that just created a Class C offense for possession of very, very small amounts, where like under 10 grams, basically like two, three joints um, worth, and it would be a ticket instead of a jailable offense. Uh, and down to Representative Click, which had the uh, cannabinoid oil uh, bill, which basically said, uh, which basically actually tracked federal legislation that says, you know, uh, substances, the cannabinoid oils that don't have, uh, is below a certain threshold on THC, and you can't get high off of it. It's just purely an oil created from uh, mar uh, marijuana. 
um, to treat very severe forms of uh, uh, seizures and other type Epilepsy. of neurological ailments, yeah. And I think that there's actually a clinical trial at, at TCH right now that's looking at cannabinoid oil. So I'm sure that there are some so. families here that are very happy that that measure went the way it did. But I think some of the discussion on the floor is that created from the bill is that I think there is an appetite by the membership that Texas is about ready to tackle some of these issues more head on. I think there's still a lot of uh, very uh, strong opposition from, from the social conservatives say like, you know, we're not, you know, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug and everything like that. But there's a lot of people who maybe on like the sort of like the libertarian side and on the democratic side say like, look, we're tired of people getting locked up for a drug that o over half the population has used sometime in their life. Right. And I mean, on a broader level, there's been not just this session, but for a few sessions now, um, a push to dial back some of right. the criminal right. penalties on a variety of things and to try and reduce jail population. Right. And Texas has, in some ways, been a leader on that. I, I think that stalled a yep. bit in this session. But where that comes from, and, and, it, and it is something that has been pushed by some, mm -hmm. some conservative folks, is that, you know, we spend a lot of money on this. Yep. Right. And if we put fewer people in jail, we could spend less money on it. Right. Um, so, I mean, what one, one place that there has been an advance, and there was a bill that was passed uh, by Representative Ruth Jones McClendon, was yes. to... Uh, to create an innocence commission. I mean, Texas has had a lot of people um, be exonerated, right. uh, people who've been in jail for 10, 20, 30 years that were subsequently exonerated on DNA testing. Um, and she passed a bill to form a commission to sort of study how did they get convicted in the first place and how can we prevent this going forward? And kind of on a similar note, one of the issues that um, my advocacy client struggles with uh, for all the time is uh, former offender housing. We have right. a tremendous number of people in Texas who have been convicted at some point in their life of a felony crime. And if you take all the people that are in prison, all the people that are on parole, all the people that are on probation, right. all the people that are off paper, it's it's like a million people. Right. And they all have to live somewhere and they right. all have to work somewhere. <clears throat> and, and it's even worse if they've been convicted of a sex crime. Of well, sure, that's, and that's the hardest uh, subset of that to deal with, but for everybody else, um, in the apartment industry, we, we struggle with that because on the one hand, um, there's a whole lot of people and they have to live somewhere. On the other hand, you know, we are constantly being, being pressed by the police and, and by others, you know, by, by neighborhoods, by right. our residents, you know, to, to be very careful to, about, you know, who we rent apartments to. Recidivism is high enough that you can make a credible argument that a right. person who's been convicted of a crime presents a, a, a threat. And, you know, we uh, can be held civilly liable for that sometimes. We had a bill which passed this time, Sinfronia Thompson from Houston uh, carried it, which creates uh, some liability protection for owners who rent to people who have committed certain nonviolent crimes, right. um, which doesn't solve the problem, but it's a great first step. We right. sort of did that two years ago with employment, and we extended it to housing this time. I, I think. Uh, that's actually a, and he's right. I mean, that's a huge issue that I think the legislature is starting to tackle of, like, we spend all, every session, we increase the criminal penalties for this, that, and the other, you know? I mean, I, I always jokingly argue with people, like, look, why don't want to just make everything a first degree felony and get it over with? Because we're going to get there eventually, so let's just go ahead and do it. And in our business, people always want to make a list. It's right. like, well, it's okay to rent to people that did this, but it's not okay right. to rent to people that did that. And from your days as a prosecutor, how many people actually got convicted of the thing that they did? Oftentimes they, they don't because we will we'll plead it down to You this, have to plead it right? down. So you yeah. get someone who comes into your office. Or we'll trade and, with them and say like, look, we, you don't right. plead to this, but what, but what if we if we recharge you as this? Would you, you know, we'll make a deal with them because maybe this case isn't that strong or, or the facts don't fit exactly or the witness, maybe the, what the victim wants. But I always yeah. use this example when we talk about it. You, get, you have two people the same day that come into your office, they right. each want to rent an apartment. They've each been convicted of uh, possession of a controlled substance. Right. Now the first guy, you don't know this, but the first guy sparked up a doobie at a Steve Miller band concert right. in 1978 and did it in front of an undercover cop. You know, do you have a problem running to that guy? No, of course not. The other guy's a dealer, yeah. but because he made a deal to rat out his supplier, they were able to work out right. something 
where you know he was able to plead to possession. Well, you don't want that guy, but you don't know. Right. You don't have any way to, of knowing because of the the, pr the the predominance of plea bargain. And you don't know who's who. And that's actually a real big issue because uh, the commercial sites that sell criminal history don't really <coughs> tell you what someone is convicted of or what their base. They just said drug conviction, or they said theft. Right. But there's a bit of difference between somebody who you know embezzled half a million dollars versus you know, uh, you know, 37-year-old housewife who bounced a check when she was 17, but it both come out comes out as theft. Right. But even if you had the exact charge, right. you still you don't, you don't really don't. know what they did, and, so it becomes problematic. And so, one of the things I think we're going to tackle next session, definitely, I think my office is going to tackle next session, is talk about. We spent all this time talking about punishment. We don't really talk about re-education. We don't talk about reintegration into society. Is like, look, we pu we punish the heck out of people in our prisons, in, in whatever, in probation, whatever it is, but how do we make sure that they don't come back? How, what, do we do anything to make sure that they have job skills? Do we do anything to make sure that when they come out, uh, they have they have ways to find food, they have ways to find shelter? And you know, when I was a prosecutor, we literally had people who, um, you know, ex-cons who got out, who were released, fully released, not even on parole anymore, fully released, and they were at Walmart stealing meat and potatoes because they said, I, I don't have a place to live and I don't have any means to make money. You know, what am I supposed to do? Right. The, and the only thing I know is I can go steal a little food just to stay alive. So, yeah. And we're also working on the issues of dealing with old criminal records. Um, I, that's something we, we've asked for a study for is a lot of times people have these class C, like ticket level offenses that follow them for the rest of their life. Like, like at some point, those things need to drop off. At some point, um, you know, the, maybe even an arrest, a DB, DWI from 20 years ago just needs to drop off or something like that, that you got into a fight with somebody, you know, when you were 19 and you're now 45, why do you still have an assault record? And why is that still following you around? And maybe, if, you know, I think we would take a look at some ways to find ways for people to get that uh, either pardoned, expunged, or whatever it is. Well, to me, that brings up two sort of related issues, one of which is, of course, mental health, because that's yes. something that plays a, a huge role in the number of people who wind up in our justice system. And I was actually very impressed to see the number of mental health provisions that actually did make it through yes. and are on the governor's desk waiting for a signature. But, of course, the other thing that uh, people were watching closely, you know, especially in light of events over the last year, was what the session was going to do with grand jury reform. So can we talk about uh, how that measure sort of shook out and what we think is going to be the actual impact of the change? It's basically the no more bring a buddy to grand juries. Yeah. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the term is pick a pal. Pick a pal. Right. Oh. Um, same, very similar. Very alliterative. I like that. Uh, so I believe Texas is actually the very, and, and you'll hear this a lot, Texas is the very last state to use a pick a pal system. Uh, where basically the individual judges, the district court judges, will select, uh, like hand pick the their grand jury members. So each district court judge will have a three month, I believe it's a 120 day term, where they run uh, a grand jury court, and then they will pick their own people. And some of that actually has to do with the fact that it, it's hard to get people of grand jury because it's. It's not like a, like, a, like a jury service where you just go and you serve a couple of days and you're done. No, you're serving for the full term. Mm -hmm. And it's two, three days a week. And it's the entire day. So a lot of times we, we get people who are retired. So grand juries generally tend to be older people. Um, and, and not to put too fine a point on it, but older people in this state are more white. And conservative. Yeah. Um, so some of the, so what, what we've done with the bill that was passed... Uh, by uh, Senator Whitmire and uh, uh, Representative Dutton is basically they can still pick people to be on the jury, but they cannot basically say, I want that individual person on my panel. That the, the people that are picked go into a main, big pool of people who want to do grand jury service, and then the computer randomly picks them out to fill out a grand jury panel. Yeah. So I it's mean, not perfect, but it's better, a lot better, better. than what we had. Yeah, I mean, you know, the I think the, the the full reformers' argument was for grand juries to be picked in exactly the same way as juries, as, as so-called pettit juries. Yeah. Um, you know, some other aspects of this reform that I don't think came up 
I mean, Representative Wu is right, you know, grand jury service is a bigger commitment. Well, one thing you could do to make it possible for more people to serve would be to have more flexible hours yeah. for it. You know, have some sessions at night or on, or even on a weekend so that people who, you know, work nine to five jobs, you know, can be eligible to serve on a grand jury. Or, or, pay, or pay them better. So pay, people will say, like, I'm okay too. missing some work for this because it's roughly equivalent to what I would have made. But that's, but that's a hard sell to the counties and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but, get it, but getting this, for, you know, again, we, we've used this term a lot. It's a good first step. Yeah. I mean, it was a necessary reform, and it is something to, you know, we can see how it works and we can build on it. Chronicle got its first ever Pulitzer Prize off that issue yes. this right, year, yes, so it was, it was uh, I think, good that it, it, it uh, Lisa Falken asked Lisa Falkenberg, yes. yep. yeah. um, Wonderful. who wrote uh, extensively about that issue. My view, first of all, as a community college teacher, grand juries are one of the hardest things to teach to students to make them understand why, what's the difference between a grand jury and a regular jury and how the justice system works. Um, and uh, on the, I guess just from the public policy side, I was never convinced that the motive behind the way they did it was evil or with no. an intent to, to be biased. It was just for what Representative Wu said, it's difficult to get people who can take that much time. You know, the a random jury people picked off the street at random, a lot of them really can't, don't have that kind of commitment. Even if you paid them, even if you said we'll meet at night sometimes, they wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was a it was a really good first step. I think it was uh, good for the state. I yeah. think it made the city of Houston look good. And I think some of it is just to remove the the image of impropriety. Is I, I'm not sure that doing the grand jury from a wheel really will make that big of a difference in the actual outcomes of the of the of the grand jury process. But it it it, it passes the smell test. Yeah, I think I think that that's right, and and there has also been kind of a push here in the education of grand juries um, generally. You know, people there have been I think at least half a dozen seminars I'm aware of about how to become a grand jury member. Here's the form you have to fill out, et cetera, et cetera. So the information is out there. One hopes that you know the measure coupled with the greater information about how to do it means if somebody feels passionately that you know grand juries need to be more in line with the people they might be having to make decisions about, then they can have a way to be engaged in that. Um, and speaking of engagement, uh, there were a couple of measures that the League of Women Voters were looking at in particular this session around voting, uh, one of which we were very pleased about um, is that the uh, a measure passed that allows people who want to be a deputy voter registrar to train online, um, speaking to the point about how sometimes it's difficult to get away and you know do whatever it is that you want to in terms of civic duty. Um, I think this makes it a lot easier for people who are interested in helping to man polls to get that training with without having to take additional time off from work to do it. So the League of, Wiz of Women Voters was very pleased about that measure. The other one we were watching, though, that did not fare so well was the idea of online voter registration, which we have seen pass in a couple of other jurisdictions, Colorado being the one that comes to my mind. So can we talk about why we think it didn't work out here, and do we think that there would be a time in the future that maybe we could push Texas toward that model? Well, a lot of the objections to um, the online voter registration uh, bill came from from here in Harris County. Um, I wanted just to talk about the other thing for a second. I, I've done deputy voter registrar training, and yeah, you go in. It's a couple of hours. It's really nothing that you couldn't do online. I mean, just a, a simple computer-based training, web, you know, mm. a little, a couple of web, a couple of videos, and then a quiz at the end. It, it's it's not rocket science. I mean, you, you need to make sure you know what boxes to check and and how how to process the form. Anyone can do it, and it, it, you know, I, I agree. That's a big step forward. I, as far as the online voter registration um, thing went, like I said, a lot of the objections came from Harris County, in particular from the county clerk and the uh, tax assessor. Um, I will say, um, you know, the the intent of the bill was to essentially turn what was it was. It, you know, to turn a lot of this over to the Secretary of State um, for the processing. Um, and, you know, we had a bill that came out in the last session that did something similar for yep. uh, vehicle registrations. And as we all know, this year it didn't go very smoothly. So to that extent, I can understand the reluctance 
on, a, on the part of county officials, you know, when the state says, hey, trust us, we got this, I, I can understand that. Having said that, I mean, you know, we can all pay bills on our phones, we can bank on our phones, we can, we can do all kinds of things, you know, on a little device in our hands. It, you know, it doesn't make sense. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it over to you, Andy, <laughs> spe speaking for, you know, the young people. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't make sense to them that they can't register to vote. They do everything. My students do everything online. They, they, they read their textbook online. They take their quizzes online. You know, the, the, anything that they can't do online seems incredibly antiquated to them. So, you know, from a, a community college teacher's perspective, I get it. And I think it's inevitable. I mean, we're going we're yeah. to be there eventually. But at some point, we're going to vote online. There's, there's no question about that in my mind. Where I guess I do deviate from the script a little bit when I'm, I'm teaching because all the textbooks that you ever read about Texas government say, well, the reason uh, voter turnout is so low in Texas is because it's so hard to register to vote. It's just such a terribly painful, difficult process. You put your name on a postcard, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really not all that cumbersome, not all that difficult. Um, and I understand that some of the reluctance for the reasons, Charles, that you said, um, that, you know, that, that, you know, is the state actually going to do this efficiently? They have a pretty easy process now. It works pretty well. I think they wanted to make sure that, um, that, it, that it's going to work the way it, it's advertised before they, before they switch. But I think it's inevitable that we'll end up there. And, and the thing is, I, this was actually a measure that was brought uh, in 2013 and it was authored by a Republican. Um, and so... You know the the measure that was uh, was being carried by a Democrat this time, and this this is actually a it was a bipartisan issue, um, and, and really because uh, the studies that have been done on electronic registration have have shown it doesn't benefit either party. People no new people really come into the system because we moved to electronic system. It just makes it saves a little money because we don't have to process paper, and it just makes people's lives a little easier. Now that being said, I think a lot. I think a lot of the opposition, you know, outside of what people say, the reason why they're opposing it, you know, look, everything that that every new system is going to have its flubs, like the vehicle registration, uh, ACA, everything when it starts out, especially if it's a big program, are going to have some hiccups. It's just the nature of things, you know. Uh, if you if you told, you know, Apple invent a uh, invent the iPhone from scratch. Like today, I bet you that what they're going to put out is going to have a lot of problems, you know, instead of being developed over time. So that being said, I think a lot of the issues behind it of why it was killed, I think there's still some residual people who say like, oh, you know, this is going to help Democrats and hurt Republicans. And so we have to go kill this thing. When, when the reality of it is. It doesn't really help anybody. But if the technological flub means I can't look at my cute cat pictures, that's one thing. If it changes the outcome of an election, you know, I think that's maybe a little different. Well, and the thing is, that's, that's, that would be true if you had an electronic-only registration. If you could still register the normal way, but the electronic wor version way is like, well, this is all screwed up. I can't do this. Let me just order a card. Right. And, and I would point out, you know, again, from a security perspective, you know, you may maybe you're concerned that the person registering to vote yeah. is is not, who not representing who they are. Well, you know, how's well, it different from a card though? You know, and we have to, when we show up to vote, we have to show voter, we have to show an ID card. So it's like, you know, we got security at one end and the, you know, the, yeah. I mean, and, and for all the machinations of like, oh, there's going to be this apocalypse and that apocalypse uh, when you, if you do this and that. Like, in the reality of it is. No one can point to any example of any real fraud that's been that's going to happen. Other states have done the electronic registration. No one's been able to point to like this is this is the nightmare that was created. It's like well, it's just like anything else. I mean, it has a little hiccup at the beginning, and after a while, it just operates. People get used to it. Um, they it, they're more convenienced by it. Government saves a little money, and we move and on. I, I still think it's inevitable. It'll yeah, be it's, two, it's two inevitable. years from now, maybe four years from now, but it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, people expect it. I mean. You know, you can do everything else online. Right. It doesn't make sense that you can't do this online. Yeah, that's right. And so just maybe one last question on that, because we are back uh, in last year's elections when we were speaking to county um, candidates. One thing that they mentioned a lot of is just 
it's kind of like moving mountains to get money to build county infrastructure. So if the way forward is online registration, what's it going to take to get our county, Harris County, ready for online registration? Um, is it is it going to be a shift to a model like what we have with vehicle registration where it's just taken out of the county's hands entirely? Or what do we think that looks like? Well, I, I think you're right. Resources is always an issue. And, you know, someone's, someone somewhere is going to have to, you know, build, you know, build up a demonstration website to do it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, it's, it's the programming and it's the back end. Right. I mean, the, the front end programming is, is generally not that hard. I mean, it's it's the it's the back end, both in terms of building the database, making sure you've got all the components, and making sure it's secure. But you know, again, we're we're not inventing the wheel here. Okay. Twenty states have this. Yeah. You know, we can look at what Colorado and other states have done and say, okay, that works, that doesn't work. And, you know, and, and it's literally, it's a web form. How, I mean, yeah, it's it's not it's, like we don't know how to do that in general. Right. Well, and here's the thing: is the real question is. How much does it cost right now for a, for a human being to physically receive cards that are handwritten and they have to stare at it for how long before they can figure out what did this guy write? Yeah. Like, I can't read this handwriting and then like, well, you think, is that an A or an E? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, we, we laugh about that, but that's actually a big reason why right. voter registrations get rejected mm -hmm. because the person who receives the card can't tell what the name is or they transcribe it incorrectly. Right. And then it doesn't match your ID when then you vote. And it doesn't match your ID. Right. And I, I've actually had that happen <clears throat> to me. So, you know, I mean, you know, one of the nice things about having a web form is, you know, you can, you, you can put a certain amount of error checking right into it, you know? So it, it's, yeah, I mean, inevitable I, is the right word. I would like for us not to have 254 separate systems to do this, you know, <laughs> no, when, and when uh, we go to I think it's going to be like the vehicle registration. It'll just move to the state. The state will run the website and, you know, every, the county gets, well, the, the money the county gets to spend on it now gets, gets spent somewhere else. Um, we, we can build like extra two feet of road. There you go. <laughs> 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 Might make the commute easier. So I, I think sort of the last thing I want to talk about from session before we shift gears to what's next, because I do have some questions about that too, is um, the other thing that we heard a lot about locally and um, did pass at least some level of measure is the pre-K education. We heard Governor Abbott say it was important. Obviously, there's been a huge push in Harris County for um, full day pre-K. Didn't quite get right. the level of fiscal support that we were all hoping for, but uh, do, we, do we think that this is sort of the beginning of greater investment in early ed, or is this what we're going to have to just live with for now? I mean, you, you'll forgive me, I'm going to be a little bit cynical about this. The amount of money that was... <laughs> uh, good, you know, I thought I was going to be a little the, the money. <laughs> the amount of money that was appropriated for this, I believe it was $130 million, check me if... I mean, yeah, that's, was, I, I think was less than, I mean, maybe it was about one-third less than the amount that was cut in 2011. So yep. we're not even back to where we were four years ago. The money that is being spent here is not going to enroll a single kid in pre-K. What it's doing is it's essentially offering grants to existing pre-K programs to bring them up to standard. Right. Now, there's value in that. I mean, you know, pre-K in and of itself is not is neither good nor bad. It has to be done right. Um, and there are certain, you know, there, there's scholarship that says, do these things in this way and you get better results. So as far as that goes, it's good. But if what we want is actually to get kids into pre-K, yeah, it was going to cost a lot more. I mean, Wendy Davis proposed that during the you know, gubernatorial campaign, and she was pilloried for not saying how she was going to pay for it. Well, guess what? I mean, Texas has about $18 billion unspent um, between the rainy day fund and just other money lying around not being used. What, what she was proposing would have cost about $800 million. If that. You know, that, that was, you know, so that we're talking couch cushion money. We could have gotten that. We didn't. So, well, I mean, sorry, rant off. <laughs> no, I mean, and this has been actually a huge, uh, you know, we talk about property, local property taxes going up and up. I mean, a lot of that is, you know, uh, the amount that we spend on public education is split between state sources, local sources, and then the feds. The feds have always, I mean, the fed, the fed spending is consistent throughout. Like, it doesn't really change. Um, what's really changed is the amount that a state has been putting in is 
decreasing if you adjust for inflation, and the amount that the local areas has been putting in to make up for it is increasing steadily. So you talk, I mean, like the legislature screams about property taxes, but we're the ones causing the property tax increase because we're giving tax cuts. Like we gave like what, $4.4 billion in tax cuts and the amount we're actually funding education is going down. Yeah, I mean, the, the last yeah. uh, school finance lawsuit was over the fact that um, the way the state did, you know, evaluation limits and property right. and property taxes was declared an unconstitutional statewide property tax and the way they solved it was they cut property taxes by a third yeah well yeah. And, and and so I mean and beyond that and sort of like you know driving Democrats into a fit is uh, we the house passed a half billion dollar measure for quote unquote border security and you know we asked hey what are you guys gonna spend the money on and, and you know the response is nah don't worry about it We'll we'll tell you after we spent it, yeah. right? And I mean, but 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 we went, we went beyond that. We wouldn't. The Senate didn't send back the half billion dollars. The ten, Senate says we'll ask for eight hundred million dollars, which is about as much as Wendy Davis's pre-K program would have cost. And and you know we, we then we then we say that like oh we can't afford uh, the Hazelwood. We can't afford pre-K. It's like well we couldn't take in a, a hundred million dollars out of the quote unquote border security that we don't know what we're going to spend it on. You know, and here, go buy a dozen helicopters and whatnot that you just fly them around. But we couldn't take that money and put it into pre-K, put it, couldn't put it in the Hazelwood that we can f educate veterans. And, and Army wife, so you're speaking my language. Not to interrupt this epic <laughs> rant, but we actually do have another caller on the phone. So caller, welcome to Public Affairs Public Access. What's your name and what's your question? James, I called before. The representative just uh, mentioned what I was calling about was this 800 million going to the DPS. The DPS will not a answer questions about this and other subjects. Um, will anyone hold them accountable? And I'll, I'll hang up. Well, and no, that's 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 what was the argument on the floor is we're going to give DPS three quarters of a billion dollars, and we ask them. So, what do you guys want to do? What are you guys going to do with it? Yeah. And they said, "Yeah, we'll tell you. We'll tell you after we spent it." Yeah, and in fact, I mean, I, I believe it was early, earlier this session, um, I think Representative Donna Bl Howard, yeah. I think it was, and and some others and brought up Blanco. Right, Cesar Blanco brought up, you know, uh, hey, you know, can can you actually show us any evidence that this money you're spending right. has an effect? I mean, because when you know when in, illegal immigration increases, you say, "Oh, we we need the money." You know, because we, you know, there's more, more of it happening. When it decreases, you say, "Look, what we're doing is working, so we need more money to do more of it." Yeah. Well, and, and I think one of the big things is DPS. So uh, members of the House have asked DPS, "Hey, can you tell us what your numbers look like?" And the DPS sends sends over this big packet of, "Oh, we made, you know, in the border area, we made this many arrests and this many seizures, this many pounds of marijuana, this many tons of cocaine," and. But what they don't say is, oh, by the way, those those were basically done by other agencies. Yeah, and we taking credit them, for the federal stuff. Right, the feds have made that seizure. The border sheriffs, uh, INS, uh, border security, and they said, well, wait, 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 wait. Tell us what you have done by yourself, disaggregated from all the other law enforcement agencies. And DPS was strangely quiet. Right. And now we're going to say, here's three quarters of a billion dollars. You know, bef and we, we, I mean, we try to say, like, before we give you this three quarters of a billion dollars, tell us what result we're going to expect. And silence. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, as a community college teacher, one of the most difficult subjects for my students is federalism, which is sort of the concept of which governmental level is right. supposed to do what. Well, this isn't going to make my job any easier <laughs> because, you know, it's an international border, obviously, right. and uh, it, that's not normally a state function in any meaningful way. So it's certainly difficult. And, and, and well, I think, uh, and so I'm sorry, I have, I have more of the rant about, but um, <laughs> one of the big things is like uh, DPS touts how many more <clears throat> tickets it's given. I'm like, in my, in my hand, I'm like, wait, are you honestly equating speeding tickets and no seatbelt tickets to security and safety? 
Like, what what exactly are we talking about? Hey, there's, there's plenty of small towns in this state that give out plenty of speeding right, tickets. Right, but, <laughs> you know, um, those are, anyways. So we have about three minutes left. What I would like to do is give each of you to tell me, you know, if you can engineer what the next session looks like, what's the number one thing that you would like to see happen? Well, the number one thing that is going to happen one way or the other is, is school finance. I mean, yeah. it is possible that the Supreme Court could overrule the district judge's opinion, but they came close to doing this, you know, they came close to this very thing back in 2005, um, which was that the, you know, the system that we had was inadequate. And that was before we cut $5 billion in 2011. That still hasn't been restored. One way or the other, the legislature is going to have to deal with this. They tried. Yep. Representative Aycock, yep. to his great credit, tried to, to do some of it. Um, you know, different, different school districts get different allocations of money. There's, you know, what, three people in the entire state that understand it, and, and one of them, you know, one of them Scott Hochberg. Um, My predecessors, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, ha it has to happen. So whenever we have school finance issues or school issues, members will like say, I wish, I wish Hochberg was here and everyone turns and looks at me like, I, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> he resigned. Um, I, I agree with, with Charles. Um, school finance is good. I mean, I think it's either going to be a special or we're going to deal with it next, next, uh, next term. Um, I, I think it's better off as a special to come back uh, before the next session, before elections, um, and deal with it. School finance is going to be ugly. Someone's going to get hurt. Uh, some school district, there's, it's, I mean, not to put it so bluntly, but it's basically a zero-sum game. Somebody's going to get... Well, there will be more money added, but you're there'll right. There'll be more money, but right. somebody's going to get there's shafted. Gonna winners Someone's going to get unhappy. Um, you know, it ends up being a, a rural versus urban fight. Sometimes it ends up being a suburban versus urban fight. Um, no matter what it is, somebody's going to be upset. Um, my personal... Issues. I, I really want to focus on uh, a lot of uh, uh, workforce development uh, and issues. I want to do more ju criminal justice reforms. Uh, juvenile raise the age is one of, one of my big, big topics. This is one of the things we didn't get to. We we got rid of uh, criminality for truancy, and but uh, raise the age for juveniles was something that was not addressed, and we're, we're I think we're ready for it. All right, Andrew. Well, and I guess since they did. Uh K through 12 education mostly, I'll talk about higher education and, and particularly community college education. Community colleges are becoming a much more critical component of the higher education system than uh, ever before and uh, they rely largely on local property taxes. I think the state's going to need to address that. Yeah. Great, thank you. I, well, I want to say thank you so much to um, all of you for joining me tonight. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Representative Fu. Thank you, Charles. And uh, for everyone at home, I hope you uh, learned as much as I did in this session. <laughs> On behalf of the League of Women Voters Houston and Houston Media Source, thank you for jo uh, joining us for Public Affairs Public Access. I'm Rita Hicks, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>